Good morning. So our topic today, and we can, you can put up the first slide, is Christian self-centeredness. And we're looking at uh, a passage in Mark uh, in this series uh, on Mark, Mark chapter 9, verses 33 to 50, if you'd like to turn to it. I'll be putting all the verses. I'm not going to read them ahead, but I will put all the verses on the screen as we go. Uh, so either way is great. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. The setting, at a moment that they should be extra focused on Jesus, Jesus catches the disciples being fully self-focused. They came to Capernaum, verse 33, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. Uh, the setting is actually worse than it looks. <laughs> Just recently, um, their, last, their last attempt to do significant ministry was the attempt to exorcise the demon out of the young boy as they came down from transfiguration. You may remember uh, a couple times ago we were talking about that. And it didn't go well. You would think that would lead to a bit of humility, but evidently not. Then, if you look back a few verses, Jesus, right after that, goes into something that he's now done, I think, three times, which is to try to get them ready for the idea that as their leader, the one that they should be emulating, he is getting ready now, emotionally, etc., spiritually, to suffer and be killed for the benefit of others. That also didn't sink in. It didn't... Jesus began to emphasize more and more, and has been emphasizing more and more, how important it is to serve others, to put others ahead of yourself. Uh, Eventually, he's going to say, and this will be one chapter later, uh, ne next slide, Mark 10.45, and this is considered by most people the, the, the center verse of the whole book of Mark. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. With all of Jesus' emphasis on self-sacrifice and all of the reminders coming to the disciples that they had a long ways to go, they had a lot of things to be humble about, they were thinking the opposite. Which one of us is going to be the greatest? We know that self-centeredness haunts all of us as believers we were born incredibly self-centered people. Uh, we inherited that from Adam and Eve, according to the Bible. I know I'm going to knock this off. And I have to say, I've yet to meet a baby, even in this wonderful church, that's mostly thinking about others. And I can say that even 67-year-olds tend to think of themselves. I rarely wake up in the morning with the first thought, gee, I wonder how my neighbor's doing. I don't think that. Maybe a few hours later, eventually I get to that. Our default position uh, from the time we're born is to, is to be a taker, not a giver. And we've all learned that, unfortunately, even when you come to Christ and have the blessings of the indwelling Holy Spirit, it continues to be a struggle. And that's what this passage is about. How do we root out those last pieces of self-centeredness that come out in the most embarrassing ways based on the experience of the disciples? Uh, next slide. So, teaching number one, 
on self-centeredness from Jesus. God's priority is that we should show caring attention to the believers who least benefit us. Who are the people in your life that it's easiest to ignore? Because they can't do anything about it. They don't have the power. The, socially, in, in the culture, uh, they, they aren't viewed as having any rights, at least compared to you. Who are those people? Uh, that, that's uh, the first teaching from Jesus is, those are the people we should focus on and pay caring attention to. So, so, verse 35, And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, and this is talking about first in God's eyes, so you might, at least I mentally put that in there. If anyone wants to be first as far as God's concerned, he should be last of all and servant of all. Then, right on the spot, Jesus creates a nice visual illustration by plopping a little key, kid on his knee and says, and, and verse 36, and he took a child and placed him among them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Let me stop here for just a second. They were most likely speaking Aramaic. That was the daily language uh, of most Jewish people of that time. How many people have heard of the word Aramaic? How many people know anything about that language? Not near as many. A couple like this. Okay. So, one minute on Aramaic. So, uh, Syria the larger country above Israel that for most of history has been more powerful than Israel. Probably not right now, but in most centuries has been more powerful than Israel. Um, the Syrian word for Syria is Aram. In the Bible, you, if you read Hebrew, Syria never shows up. Aram shows up. And they speak Aramaic. And because Syria was normally the most powerful country in that little region of, of the Palestine area there on the east uh, coast of the Mediterranean, it, it sort of became the unofficial international language. So, for, for, exist, for example, when um, the Babylonians uh, conquered lots of land... They said, you know, all these people know Aramaic. Let's make Aramaic the official language of this empire. And that happened uh, with the Persians after them. Uh, so uh, that, that's, I think, maybe what you want to know about Aramaic. Uh, there's a few chapters in the Old Testament that are written in Aramaic, not Hebrew. Um, you can't tell by flipping pages, it's just that the spelling isn't right. And you can tell you're in a new language if, well, anyway. So, there are a few chapters uh, in the Old Testament written in Aramaic because they were written by people deep within the government. So, Esther, remember, she was a government official, was she not? So, some of Esther is written in Aramaic. Daniel was a government official, so some of his book is written in Aramaic. Anyway, there you go on Aramaic. The reason, the reason I'm bringing up Aramaic at all is to say that in Aramaic, servant and child are, is the same word. It's just unimportant people. People that are in the way and I can ignore and I probably will. Okay? So, when Jesus plops the kid in front of him, in English it looks like we're now going to get a speech about how you treat kids. But that's not really it. We're going to get a speech on how to treat people you can get away with ignoring or being rude to. That's what this is about. Whoever receives one child slash servant like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. 
the way that we treat the lesser people in our lives, uh, if it was kids, we might say little people. I'm going to say lesser people since I know that he's also thinking adults. Is, is viewed by God as us treating him the same way. He takes, God takes it personally, not how we treat people more powerful than us, our boss or whatever. He takes personally the way we treat the unimportant or unpowerful people in our lives. So, for example, uh, next slide. Uh, here's a couple verses from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 14.31. One who oppresses the poor, there's a lesser person, one who oppresses the poor taunts his maker. One who is gracious to the needy honors him, him meaning God, the maker. The next verse, one who is gracious to a poor person is lending to the Lord. He will repay for the good deed. So here's a good application question that I've been struggling with this week. If God measures my treatment of God based on how I treat the people in my life I can easily ignore, how is God feeling right now about me? Chew on that one. I didn't do very well either. But that, that's, I would say, that, I think that's, that's the application from Proverbs and from Mark. Next verse. So teaching number one, God's priority was showing caring attention to the believers who least benefit us. Teaching number two, God honors anyone who serves Him, so should we. We should honor anyone who serves God, even the unimportant people who are serving God, quote, unquote. Of course, God doesn't view them as unimportant. We catch ourselves viewing them that way. Verse 38, John interrupts Jesus to let Jesus know that John is doing something cool in spite of that embarrassing thing about who's the greatest, and it's going to backfire. John said, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him. Should John really be the one telling people how to exercise or who gets to exercise? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, oh, we need to go to the next slide. I'm sorry. I've got you one behind. And go one more. There we go. Verse 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. So here's someone doing significant ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, but he's not in our little circle. So we think we should hinder him, we should stop him, and Jesus will thank us for that. Another way that Christians fall into self-centeredness. My church is the best. My small group's the best. I'm actually doing God a favor if I diminish what you're doing and maybe stop you completely. I hope none of us ever get caught doing that. Jesus said, notice how patient Jesus is. He should be throwing things by this point, I think. Jesus said, do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, so this would be a, a very humble servant of Christ serving in, in the way that they're able, which is to hand you a glass of cold water. That maybe takes them to the limits of their skills and resources. What do we do with that? Well, we ignore them. They're not very important. We just grab the water and keep moving because we're important, right? Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So when the least important believer serves us, 
God notices and plans sets aside for them a reward. And we don't know if this is a reward during earthly life or a reward in heaven. It doesn't specify. But the point is, God is watching every believer, and he's looking for humble service, and that's what's going to be rewarded. Uh, Next slide. Teaching number three, discouraging and mistreating the least important believer is a severe sin. Uh, Let's go to the next slide that has the verse. Verse 42. So now this is uh, teaching number three. Whoever causes one of these lesser ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him if a heavy millstone is hung around his neck and he is thrown into the sea. It would have been better if he had physically died rather before harming, discouraging, Uh, The word, actually, the Greek word is scandalize. So, offend, discourage, cause to sin. It's a lot broader than uh, what it says here, cause them to sin. It's any, any negative impact on the most humble believer that you can find. Um, God would say, man, if only you died before you did that. Now, this isn't talking about going to hell or anything like that. It's just sort of ending your earthly life right here. It would have been a good stopping point right before you did that thing is the idea. So think of this illustration. Uh, someone, Someone is on the phone and they're calling a friend. And she says, I had to call you. My husband just called. He's in, the hosp- he's in the hospital. He was out driving, and he got in a crash. And they need to keep him overnight at least, figure out what all is going on with him. The second person says, how terrible. Where was he going? The first person, the wife, says, well, yeah, he, it, it he was out in the rain in the dark, which, which was not great, but, but he just felt he was on his way to talk to a couple in, the, in our small group. And he just felt burdened. He, he wanted to share with them uh, that, that the, the small group feels really bad um, that this couple, I mean, they live in a really small house, and it's kind of a humble house, and, and we feel bad for you because... Um, It's kind of hard to cram us all on your living room. We're sure it's very inconvenient for you. And he wanted to share that probably it's very difficult on your budget to provide the kind of desserts that we're used to in our small group. And and we feel bad for you about that. We also feel bad, well, actually, your your neighbors, your neighborhood, it makes us kind of nervous. We feel like there's probably a lot of pit bulls on your street and we just we just we don't we don't we'd rather not walk up your driveway in the dark i mean we're just trying to be honest and so for you for you we're just for your benefit maybe maybe you'd want to find a group a small group that that's more like well you know And the second person on the phone says, wow, so he was going to say all that. Yeah. And she says, well, I guess it's good he got in a crash, huh? <laughs> well, who would say that? What a terrible thing to say. Jesus would say that, wouldn't he? Jesus would say that. Whoever causes one of the lesser ones... To be offended. It is better for him if a heavy stone is hung around his neck and he's thrown into the sea. Teaching number four self centered sinning. So, this is another category of self centeredness. This is us sinning, but having a very casual attitude about it. 
Maybe it's, well, no one saw it, so it's not that big of a deal. Or, well, yeah, I did, I did hurt or offend or, uh, someone. I insulted someone to their face by mistake. I mean, really, we don't see him that often. It's, it's not that. So, self-centered sinning. Uh, a, self, a selfish attitude towards our own sin. Minimizing our sin in some way. A casual reaction to sin, as far as God's concerned, multiplies the sin. So, next verse. Uh, I'm going to read all the way through this, then I have quite a few comments. How are we doing, Tom? Okay. 43 through 49. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot is causing you to sin, cut it off and says the same thing. It's better for you to enter life. And when he says enter life, we now know that he means enter the next, the, the next age. I would call it the millennium. Not everyone does. Uh, but, then, but the age to come. It's that, that's the life that Jesus is referring to. And if your eye, verse 47, is causing you to sin, throw it away. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be thrown in hell. Where, quote, their worm does not die and the fire is not extinguished from the book of Isaiah. For everyone will be salted with fire. I have some uh, background comments I want to give uh, before we dig into the verses themselves. The first thing I want to point is, I don't know if you noticed, notice the numbering on the verses, how there's missing verses. That's pretty weird, right? No verse 44, no verse 46. And we've come across this in the book of Mark. Uh, A couple of you preachers have, have mentioned it. Um, but, but in those prior situations, what was up for question was one or two words. Now we're talking more like ten words. And so I want to I deal with it. Um, if you have a decent translation, um, and those verses like this Bible, this is the New American Standard. Uh, if you have a decent translation... Um, those missing verses are actually listed below in a footnote because the translators of this particular Bible, as well as the NIV and the ESV and several Bibles, let me give you the exceptions. The, 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 oh, so, the Bibles that will sometimes put verses in the footnotes because they're not sure they should be there. Um, are most of the Bibles we read now, NASB, NIV, ESV, what else is out there? New Living Translation, pardon? Yeah, um, they, are, they, they are translated by folks who, when they get, when you get to a verse that's not in all the ancient Greek manuscripts, and it's, it's in some of them, um, they, they lean towards assuming that probably they weren't original. And I'll tell you how that could happen in a second. And so the good ones will list them in the footnotes. If you have a Bible that leaves them out and doesn't list them in the footnotes, I think that's really a bad idea. I wouldn't use that translation. That's my opinion. Um, the Bibles that are gung-ho and will stick everything in the text... All the wondering verses uh, are, is the King James and the New King James. And again, it has to do with the thinking. Well, it, they would say that that group of translators says, all right, some of, the, some of the manuscripts don't have this verse. The ones that we think are most important do have the verse. So we're putting them in. Now, some, the new, I believe the New King James does have an asterisk or something that says not everyone thinks this verse belongs, but we do. 
And so we, we're putting it in. Uh, the other ones will have the footnote that says, th- this is not in, they have different ways of saying it. This is, this is not in the oldest manuscripts. Sometimes they'll say it that way. Or they'll say this is not in all the manuscripts. Some they'll say it that way. So what's going on is this. You've got um, now almost 7,000 ancient Greek manuscripts. Um, maybe it's an average of one word per two pages or three pages of Scripture. Um, some manuscripts will leave out the word. By far the most common one is the word Christ, where, and you can, uh, I was going to, never mind. I, w- I wouldn't have time anyway. Uh, for instance, in the very first few verses of the book of Romans, um, Paul talks about Jesus Christ. Well, at least he talks about Jesus Christ if you have a King James. Uh, if you have one of the other Bibles that most of us have, he's talking about Jesus. That, that's probably the most common variation. Do we add Christ? Do we not add Christ? It's that kind of a thing. So that's what I was saying. Typically, it's one or two words. Here, though, it's, like I said, it's more like six or eight or ten words. So the theory, the idea is this. As these guys were copying Scripture, and this was their career as monks, one theory is they, a cool idea would come to mind, and they would scribble it in the margin. It's kind of a, a primitive study Bible. Well, a hundred by a hundred years later and ten copies later, using that copy, someone thinks it was supposed to be a verse, and it gets stuck in there. And that's why we feel good about leaving it out, okay? So that's the family of people who tend to put some words or verses in the footnotes. The other group says, no... Uh, really what happened was um, w- w- we got through the verses and that one's not in all of them, but that just means some of the copies accidentally deleted a word or three words or five words. So we're going for the long version. We want everything in there. We don't want to leave out accidental deletions. The other group saying, well, wait, now you're putting all these side comments in there that weren't supposed to be, so you can see how that, that's a problem. Now, in spite of all that, I say, and this church says, and every pastor that you should take seriously says, the Bible is without error. The Bible is without error. How can we say that? Because we're talking about the original documents. The book of Galatians, as Paul wrote it, is, with absolute, is absolutely without error. That's what the word inerrancy is about. We hold that the Bible is inerrant. There are no errors in the original text. It's God's word. God wrote it. He doesn't goof. There are no goofs. Well, that's fine. What about the Bible I'm holding in my hand? It is not the original. Here's the deal. The Bible you hold in your hand provides you 100.01% of the original text. You got that? The Bible you hold in your hand gives you 100.01% of the inerrant original. So you can have 99.99% confidence in the Bible you hold in your hand that it is God's Word. And that's true whether you've got the short one or the long one. Either way, you have in your hand 99.99% of the original text. And the Bible you hold in your hand is 99.99% authoritative. So we continue to say the Bible is God's word. The Bible has no errors. And um, for most people, that's all they need to know. Some people need to need to know that that extra sentence. However, we are talking about the original 
text, which we have exactly plus or minus a few words. But we even know what the few words would be that could go either way. So we're good. Okay? Any questions about that? If you want to ask me afterwards, I I don't want to, a lot of pastors would say, Dave, don't, don't go there. No one wants to know. You're just freaking people out. Uh, But I just felt like when you've got two verses that are either there or not there, I don't know. To me, it's getting harder and harder to ignore it. So I'll find out in about 15 minutes (laughs) whether I've ruined the church. Okay, so, so that was one background thing I wanted to say. You hold in your hands 100.01% of God's inerrant, flawless word, okay? All right, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is this thing about eyes causing you to sin and plucking them out. And... Um, I want to do that by going to Jesus' first presentation of this idea. He does teach it twice. And the reason he teaches it twice is this. It's something the Pharisees taught. By this time, first century A.D., the Jewish commoners had decided as a nation that the Pharisees were the ones that got the Old Testament right. We should follow them. Competing views, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and and the Essenes, these are other groups that read the Old Testament slightly different, but everyone's decided the Pharisees are the ones we're going to follow. We think maybe they have it right. Jesus strongly disagrees with that, but it takes him a long time to turn that ship and it, the, the disciples are as bad as all the rest of them. All the way through his three years of teaching them, the disciples keep trying to correct Jesus so that he aligns with the, the Pharisees. And he, obviously, he's, he, he fights it the whole time. So he's trying again. This is what the Pharisees taught. You have 288 body parts. They would say they know that from God. I would say they don't know that from God, but that's what they taught. And every body part is responsible for a a different sin. The great thing about that is if someone, let's say you slap someone. Now they're offended. They want to know what's going on here. They want you to apologize. I didn't do it. My hand did it. The Pharisees actually taught that, that your body parts can be blamed for sin, not you. Why did they teach that? So here's here's two minutes on uh, Pharisaic theology, that is, the doctrinal system put forth by the Pharisees. The Pharisees taught... Regarding salvation, we're going to start there. The Pharisees taught that you're saved by being born a Jew. You're saved by being born a Jew. You stay saved by keeping the law. So it's very important that you don't break the law hardly ever. Because we don't know how many you can break as a Jew and still go to heaven... We don't want to find out, but one way we can help ourselves is to keep altering what a sin is so it's harder and harder to do it. That's, that's the smart thing to do. And so they did. So now, a sin that involves your hand, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Okay, that's where this whole thing comes from, from what the Pharisees... And, and if you think about it, the... With the disciples' brains, the Pharisees have had a 30-year head start. 30 years of Saturday school, learning about what sin is. And Jesus has to come in and say this, 
the Pharisees are wrong, and I want to completely reverse this whole thing that you're, that you're talking about. Okay. Remember uh, when, when the Pharisees came uh, to John the Baptist, uh, John said, before they said anything, John said, don't talk to me about being sons of Abraham. If being sons of Abraham was anything to be excited about, God could turn all these rocks into sons of Abraham. Why did John the Baptist say that? Because he knew that they thought that they were going to heaven simply by being born a Jew. And he, he like Jesus, is going to try really hard to undermine that whole thinking. Why were the Pharisees so terribly uh, hateful towards tax collectors and prostitutes? Why is that? A prostitute, a Jewish prostitute and a Jewish tax collector is someone who was born going to heaven but found a way to go to hell anyway. They've, what, what is that sports thing? They've grasped defeat from the jaws of victory, however that goes. I know I don't have it exactly right. Disgusting, disgusting people. They still found a way to go to hell, even though they were born going to heaven, according to the Pharisees. Okay. So again, if you think you were born going to heaven because you're a Jew, now it's just keeping the law to stay going to heaven. You're working really, really hard to not sin, or maybe easier to redefine sin so you can't hardly do it anyway which is what the Pharisees became very good at. So, uh, the slide that says Matthew 5.27 at the top, oh, that's not a good thing to tell you. Uh, go to, can you try the next slide? Matthew, yeah, good. So, you have heard that it was said, this is out of uh, the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Why would Jesus have to bother with that? Because the Pharisees said, all you have to do in the whole area of lust and sex and immorality, just don't commit the act, the physical act. Everything up to then, it's okay. If it wasn't okay, Moses would have put in an 11th commandment. Also, he would have said, don't think about adultery. But he didn't, so we're, we're good. Jesus says, no. No, that isn't what Moses said. Then he goes on. So that was one way that they would minimize uh, sin, was to limit sin to actual visible actions. Your mind can be a cesspool. And God's okay, according to the Pharisees. Oh, gosh. Well, the number of sins I'm committing has gone way down. I can stop myself from doing some things and just think them all day and get away with it. That's what the, so that's the way the Pharisees was going. Next one, Jesus says, verse 29. Now, if your right eye is causing you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So, if, as the Pharisees teach, your right hand causes sin, let me tell you this, Jesus says, your whole body is going to hell. I don't know if you remember that people who die as unbelievers, they get a resurrected body. Unfortunately for them, I don't know, you remember that? Everyone is bodily resurrected. Uh, Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. If you're, if you're going to insist that your hand sins, not you, let me tell you what problem you now have, Jesus says. Your whole body is going to hell for that sin. So... If you're serious about this thing that hands can sin, you should start lopping off body parts. You have 288 of them. You need to start lopping them off 
because I'm sending you to hell. Remember Jesus, John 5, Jesus is the judge. I'm sending you to hell, with or without your hand, because you're a sinner. Okay? I want to jump to the next slide. This is where Jesus clarifies that, in fact, your hand never sins. Your feet never sin. Your eyes never sin, he says. And this is just a couple months before our passage of Mark 9, when he says, that which comes out of the person, that is what defiles the person. From within, out of the hearts of people, come the evil thoughts, the acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, acts of adultery, deeds of greed, wickedness, deceit, indecent behavior, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Notice that maybe about one-third of those are physical acts. Two-thirds of those things in Jesus' list of sins are invisible sins. Jesus has no patience with this whole thing. Well, if you can't see it, it's not a sin. But the main point here is sin always comes from one place, the deep inner self, the heart. So when Jesus says, look, if your sin, if your hand sins, well, here's the thing. Your hand never will sin. Your hand can't sin. If it could, you should cut it off. But since it can't, you don't need to cut it off. You need to fix your heart. Okay? So that's where all this stuff about cutting off hands, no one, no believer is supposed to be cutting off hands because your hand doesn't ever cause you to sin. It's if you think that's the case, why do you still... Why are you still wearing a hand? Right? That's the point. Okay. So that was the second thing I wanted to bring up before we got to the point of the verses. Um, let's see. Let's see what I know. Oh, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. So, again, uh, next slide. So teaching number four was self-centered sinning multiplies the sin. If you sin and you have a casual, selfish response, well, that's the opposite of repentance, number one. Number two, it means you're not going to go apologize. It means you're not going to give restitution for what you've done. Well, all of those mean now that you have three or four sins going on instead of one. Self-centered, casual attitudes towards sinning multiplies the sin. It doesn't shrink the sin. It multiplies the sin. Uh, the application uh, comes in verse 50. Uh, we can turn to the next slide. Uh, the application is we should be a forceful example of God's priority, which is honoring the least believer the, le the lesser believer, but in a way that keeps the peace. So the verse, verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty. So um, they use mostly uh, dead sea salt, but dead sea salt, um, I guess we would call it contaminated. It's contaminated with all sorts of other minerals since it's taken out of the lake. There's all sorts of stuff in there. But it's still salty. But over time, if it gets wet or something, the salt will go. It won't look visibly any different. But in fact, all that's left are the minerals. And they're not going anywhere. They've been there for millions or thousands of years, whatever it is. That's what they meant by unsalty salt. The salt's not salty. That, that would happen in, in, their, in their experience, okay? Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves, okay? Have salt in yourselves. What that means is we should have a flavorful impact on each other. 
We can't trust ourselves or depend on ourselves to treat the little people in our lives properly. We depend on each other to pull us aside and say, hey, Dave, I just got to bring it. I don't know. You probably don't realize, but that, that's what having salt is. That's the kind of salt in this context that Jesus wants to talk about. We are to be salty with each other. We all have a blind spot in this area of self-centeredness. We, we depend on each other. However, don't start fights. So there's a way to do it gently with wisdom. You might think of uh, uh, Galatians 6.1, etc. Uh, um, correct, pe- correct each other gently in love. You might want to look at Galatians 6 if you haven't for a while. So, be salty, but also keep the peace. Do both at the same time. That, that's what Jesus provides as the final application. Okay? Let me pray. God, we thank you for your word. Uh, I'm trusting that every one of us, including me, uh, will experience your Holy Spirit uh, speaking to us from one of these verses, uh, in particular, uh, maybe alerting us to a person or an attitude, a habit we have. Um, And we're going to remember, God, that uh, you measure our devotion to you by our devotion to uh, the least. Bless us, we pray, as we go into this week, seeking to be um, others-focused Christians. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.